So all I wanted to do is what it became, and I, I kept coming back because, as you know, um, the Lord wants us to be a, a living sacrifice. He doesn't want us dead, he wants us living. And the trouble with living sacrifices is they tend to hop off the table at regular intervals to go off and do something else that they're interested in. And then we find that doesn't work, so we have to get back onto the table again. So Lord, I'm so sorry. What is your agenda? And following the Lord's agenda, again, sounded to me like something radical. And I'm not radical. I, I like a quiet life if I can get it. Some clergy seem to thrive on rows, and they've always got some correspondence with some RA, something or other. I don't like that. I, I, I'd, I'd like peace if I can get it. And again, I was wrestling with that with the Lord at a, a later conference, about a year later. And I said, you know, Lord, you're calling me to be radical because to alter some of the things that I've been talking about, to change, seemed insuperable. Because the good is always the enemy of the best, as you will know. And there are lots of people who love that sort of thing. And he said, no, not radical, just obedient. And again, I thought, well, I think I can do that. Just to beat it. Just do the next thing that comes along. The next thing that comes along. Comes to the top of the pile, do it. Comes to the top of the pile, do it. Don't take, don't look for trouble, just one by one, bit by bit. So, um, very early on, I was encouraged by a member of our church council. He said to me, Could we please abolish the word problem? So I said, Well, yeah, if you can find another one. Well, he said special feature or opportunity. So the special feature of our congregation was that we had 170 people, all of them over the age of 70. Mm -hmm. And um, that was indeed a special feature. <laughs> so we had to think about how. And every change that we made was in order to get young people into church, to make it possible for them to come to church. And uh, those of us who are a tiny bit older, we may just have to make one or two concessions. You know, they just have to live with one or two inconveniences for the sake of young people coming into church. And I, I want to suggest to you, you know, that if you're contemplating change in the church, you need three things. Uh, and they all begin with T, which is why it's so lovely that you all speak English. So they still believe in T, begin with T, even that way in Australia. <laughs> teaching. Teaching. Tell them what you're trying to do. teach them. <laughs> I came back one Sunday night, I think I had enough really, it was 8 o'clock in the morning, I don't know if you ever had that experience, I'd run out of gas, as the Americans would say, I was tired and I must have been huffing and puffing around the church. We started at 8 o'clock in the morning, it was about half past 9 at night. And my darling wife said to me, you know, they don't know what you're trying to do. And full of grace and patience on a Sunday night, I said to her, what do you mean they know what I'm trying to do? <laughs> Tell them what I'm trying to do. She said, yeah, you did. And that was January, and it's now April. And most of them were away, and you haven't mentioned it since. And the annoying thing was she was right. So I had to go right back again. You know, we need to make disciples. Do we? Why? Well, because Jesus said, go and make Did he? Where? Well, everywhere, really, but Matthew 20. <laughs> Matthew 28 would be a start. Teach, teach. Those of you with young children will know that's how they grow. You teach them. Same old thing. It isn't that they're not listening, it's that they don't hear. Yeah. So we say it again and again and again. And uh, uh, that was the basis of our church life. We need young people to church. Do we want? Well, have a look round. And you'll see why. Oh, I see. Okay. And once they get the point, <laughs> and my pre predecessor said to me, you know, when I asked him, he said, I wouldn't try and give you advice, but I would say this don't underestimate their intelligence and don't overestimate their knowledge. And what I had was a highly educated, sophisticated congregation, perfectly capable of understanding anything that I could explain to them. But they knew nothing, because we never taught them. So I, I, I said about doing that, and at one point we made one or two little changes, and I was invited to tea by one of Her Majesty's retired ambassadors. He was a lovely man, he was about my age now, I was 35 then. And he said to me, come and have tea, and I want to understand what the point of all this change is. And there wasn't much change, actually. And uh, I said to him uh, at the tea, I said, when did you last see a young person in church? And he looked at me, and after seeing me a very long time, he said, right, so what have we got to do? And I thought, praise God. 
He became one of my greatest friends, greatest supporters and admirers, because he understood what we were trying to do. Teaching, absolutely teaching. Number two, testimony. And I would encourage you, you know, in our, in our Anglican setting, we've lost sight of how powerful testimony is. To wheel a lay person in front of the congregation, a lay person who's not paid to believe. I mean, I'm paid to believe. Some of you are paid to believe. Again, let us talk about how much. But this is somebody who's not paid to believe. This is what I was, this is what I am. And Jesus has made the difference. And you can see the Spirit of God speaking to the hearts of people. And um, if you're in a church which is not used to the concept of Alpha, you want to get it going, borrow some lovely people from another church, just for a night. Say, could I have two or three couples who will come and talk to us about the difference Jesus has made to them and how it came about. Wheel them on. And you'll find that a lot of the opposition will begin to evaporate because it's not you just banging on and on and on. It's, it's them. And the third T would be time. Most clergy, as you may have discovered, but most clergy overestimate can, what can be achieved in one year and underestimate what can be achieved in five. If you've got the microphone twice a Sunday or more for five years, you can do quite a lot. Just by going on and on and on and giving yourself time. It hasn't got to happen today. It hasn't even got to happen tomorrow. But it will happen. And what you're building up is part of this community church, um, which was a generous church. Secondly, it's a loving church for clothes. Well, I don't say any more about that. But what I found was that you know, that was why the road choir had to go. They were lovely. Some of them were converted. And they would sing up in the sanctuary, they would sing these lovely anthems, see that you love one another, and everybody would smile. And downstairs in the Roman room, you'd hear the most frightful things. And I just said, no, this isn't right. And then I discovered that we were paying them 17,000 a year, pounds, which was a lot of money in those days. It's actually quite a lot nowadays, too. <laughs> and people began to say, why do we pay people to praise God? And I said, a very good question. Just go on talking about it until finally they said, you know, I'm talking about it. When are you going to do something about it? What would you like me to do? Well, stop paying them, okay? So I explained to them that we couldn't afford to pay them anymore, and most of them left. And then I discovered that young people don't like to be sung at. They want to sing. They want to take part. They want to be, the spirit is bubbling over and over. So that was the way the Lord was working with that. It's the same thing. The generous, loving, obedient. You may, I'm sure you all know, but people out there were really hoping that somebody somewhere would believe this stuff. And um, in England, in the UK rather, we've, watered, we've tried to water this down and make it possible for people who don't believe to believe. And what, the, what surprises us is that they're not impressed with that. Because when it comes to unbelief, they've got more of that even than we have. And that's saying something. What they were hoping was that somebody would. So the answer is we've got to take time, we've got to find a way of explaining it, we've got to talk to them about it, we've got to love them through it. But this is the key to the community which people might want to join. Obedient, worshipping, I'd have put that first if I could have found a word that begins with W. Uh, but it's key, again. You know, I remember when Nikki and I were discussing whether we should have worship on Alpha. Uh, and Nikki said to me, well, let's look at it this way. You know, these are people that they, they don't believe, and we're asking them to sing praise to God. Very good question. We talked about it, we prayed about it. And I remember saying to him, well, Nikki, um, if we're training people for a marathon, at what point do we introduce to them the concept of running? So we decided we would begin to, as we mean to go on. But we started, as you may have noticed on Alpha, with a very elementary hymn that they might know from school, Praise My Side or something. And then the next week we have a hymn and a song, and the next week we have a hymn and two songs. Mm -hmm. We build up. And what I've noticed on the questionnaire is it's so often the answer to the question, what did you least like about Alpha? Answer is the worship. What did you most like about Alpha? Answer is the worship. Mm -hmm. And the pivotal point is the weekend on the Holy Spirit. When they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they want to worship. Their hearts are full of love <laughs> and the joy of the Lord, and they can't wait uh, to get singing. But we think that it's a part of the worshiping community. And if we introduce it sensitively, we just say, well, you, know, you don't have to sing if you don't want to, but this is what we do as a community. And if it's got a finite end and it's limited to one song and a hymn, they can all put up with that and begin to grow into the concept. Worship in fourth, fifthly, a serving community. 
a Serbic community. And I, I had a friend who was a Catholic priest. He was woken up quite early one morning and this distraught woman was at the door and she said, and he said to her, yes, my dear, and she said, I want to become a lapsed Catholic. So he said, well, you may just have to explain what you mean. She said, I don't know what I mean, but my friend Mary, she does everything for everybody. If your children are ill, she'll stay at home, babysit and cook them food. If she, if she did, she'll take in things for you. If you die, she'll wash your body before the undertaker comes to collect you. And every time I ask her what she is, she says she's a lapsed Catholic. And what struck me was that people out there know what the church would do and be if it was the Church of Jesus Christ. And they love it. And I've always hoped that a Hennigenti Brompton would be known, not because they clog up the parking places and rich people who've been away for the weekend can't get anywhere to put their car when they come back, but it should be known as a community which people are thrilled to have at the end of their road, and a community that serves and loves and is the sort of community that people might want to join. And then we invite them to come on the Alpha course, come to the supper. If you don't like it, don't come back. Come to the first evening. We take them through that series, as some of you will know from the, or you can look it up on the um, website if you're interested. Who is Jesus? That gives rise to the question of, wait a minute, you say Jesus is God. Why did God die? Gods don't usually die. Well, second session is, why did he die? Nicky's removed all the jargon out of it. Third session, you know, you've gone over the Bible, but surely the Bible's a very old book. You don't read that now, do you? How and why should we read the Bible? Lots of you said about the inspiration of Scripture. How and why should I pray? Does God guide today? Does God heal today? Uh, how am I going to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? What does he do? How can I resist evil? How can I make the most of the rest of my life? Is the last session, the one before it is the church and telling others. And that's the cause. And somewhere along the line there, they discover Christian community. They discover the best possible food that we can give them, the warmest, nicest room in them. We can give them in our climate uh, for free. But it needs the whole church behind it, because that costs money. And uh, the senior pastor, which is what I did with them, um, Nikki, was explaining all the time, that's why we do it. That's why we print the invitations. That's why we have a free supper. That's why we feed them. That's why we have warm the room, because we are an Alpha Church, and we want these people to come to Christ. And then we have so many people joining as it kind of builds up and builds up and builds up that we can then think about planting another church and starting the whole process all over again so that the work of the kingdom begins to, to grow. And Nicky, of course, has been running his course now for, Nicky has been running it in our own church at, for about nine, 18, 19 years. And, uh, you know, it's like grown men, really. Grown men are only small boys that have grown. And a slightly larger alpha course is only a small one that has grown. And it's grown because it's hard work, it's great fun, it involves outside people outside the church, which many Christians are not used to, never seen in their lives before. But it's all of that fun. And his current course, he runs three times a year because our calendar works like that with the school holidays, which yours, I think, works better with two, probably. That's up to you. And, um, but a rolling program. And he now has three times a year, he has a thousand people on each course, of whom it's fair to say about 400 on the team, and 800 are guests, new people from outside. And the average age of the course, he told me the other day, is currently 26 years old. It's a hugely exciting thing. And my function is simply to encourage you and to thank you for our partnership and to try and to encourage you to see that what, what we're all involved in is much bigger than any of us. And it's just because God has chosen to have mercy. And, um, and, and he's on the move. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, John. Amen. Well, we, we have a couple of minutes now if um, anybody does have any questions that they'd like to ask Sandy. Um, so if we've got a few questions, uh, have an answer those, and then at the end I might ask if you could pray for us. Would that be okay? Yeah, we'd love to do that. All right. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? This is a very quick one. Yes. In terms of your comment about not using celebrities, how come last year there was dead girls there? No, did I say not using celebrities? I didn't just say that, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think I think what we're saying is that we don't use 
celebrity, it's, it, it, it's hard to identify Al, for example, with any particular name. We use Bear Reels because he's a Christian, he loves the Lord, and he has more influence than anybody else practically on the planet. And he wants to tell everybody about Jesus. And um, if that's a way to the hearts of young people, let's go for it. But you couldn't say that Bear Reels invented Alpha. He hid it, but he loves the Lord Jesus. That would be why. And he's a lovely, lovely man, actually, too. Okay. Sorry. And, and just to add to that as well, I think, I think part of it is we don't want uh, anyone to encapsulate, you know, this is what Alpha is. We, we've certainly used Bear Grylls because he's passionate about it. And it's, uh, it's more than just him. It's, it's him saying, I did Alpha and it made an impact in my life. Um, but we certainly don't want Alpha to become about, you know, people just coming along because some celebrities coming along. That's probably the main point for us. Actually, he's a very good way of getting people to church. Young people who wouldn't otherwise come near the church. I'm unrepentant about that. I'd use anybody to invite them in. Uh, but the issue is who gets the credit for the, for the Alpha course. And Nicky was the first to say, you know, if you ask Nicky, did you invent Alpha? He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Which is strictly speaking true. He just inherited it. And now it's no longer. Any other questions? Any other quick questions? Yes, Simon. I think it would be good to share a little bit about the other Alpha courses that are Thank you. Up, Out of Alpha has grown, because what we've seen is, you know, the Americans used to say, if you catch fish, you, you need to clean them. And what we found with um, Alpha was that people coming off Alpha as Christians brought with them all the stuff that they had before they came in, um, which is why the marriage course grew out of it, uh, with an opportunity to try and heal marriages and save them. Uh, it's taken off in China. They simply love the marriage course in China. Uh, one of the government officials said to Nikki Lee quite recently, is this course compulsory in your country? He said, no. Yeah. He said, well, it should be. <laughs> they have 5,000 divorces a day in China. Wow. And the government is particularly concerned, of course, because most of their commercial activity are family businesses. And they can see that if the families are breaking up at the rate they are, that their influence in the commercial world will be affected. So they have an angle too, and so do we. There's Alpha, and out of that came then parenting teenagers, because it's such agony to see these, uh, these families in that state. Parenting teenagers, um, parenting to the parenting course, which is younger children as well. Student Alpha arose out of that because they have particular issues. Um, Alpha for prisons, which is a particular ministry as well, and Alpha in the workplace. Alpha in the Workplace started because John Mackay, who was the chairman of Air Canada in Vancouver, went to Roger Simpson, who was a friend of ours and an Englishman. He was the victor of the rector of Holy Trinity Vancouver, HTV. And John Mackay said to him, will you come to my office? He said, I haven't time to come to Alpha in the evening. I'm flying all over the world. Will you come to my office and run an Alpha for us between 1 and 2 in the afternoon, which is all the time we have got. And Roger very shrewdly, I think, under the influence of the Spirit of God, said, I will come if you will get nine other of your chief executives and managing directors to come to your office. John said, you're on. So ten of them met in his office every Wednesday for one hour. They had 20 minutes to eat and chat, they had 20 minutes for the talk, and 20 minutes for discussion of the talk. And then they were back in their office. That's taken off all over the world again. What you lose, of course, is the illustrations, because you can't... Um, abbreviate the talk, and its illustrations are tend to, to suffer. So, but it's as broad as it's talk, and, but if you would like to do that, and that's taken off again all over the world. Um, alpha in the prisons, yes, Alpha. There's Alpha for seniors, which I'm increasingly interested in. Um, that's proved to be a huge success. Again, it's just whatever works to get people to Christ, that's what it's all about. I think what the Lord wants me to say to you is something along these lines. I've called you because I love you. I haven't called you for what I can get out of you to make you work, but because I love you. Keep your hand in my hand. Some words from the end of Jeremiah 1, I think, in you. Do not say that you're young or you're old or you're to this or to that, for I have put my words into your mouth. And you will go to those to whom I send you. Tell them that I love them. Show them that I love them. You precious young people here will probably lead the way. 
because you don't have a whole lot of unlearning to do. You haven't had to do it without the wind and without the sails. But you are sensing that the Spirit is with you and you're putting up your sails and going for it, as you should, as we should. And I want you to know, young and old, that I'm with you. Father, thank you. Thank you. And I think what the Lord is doing at the moment is just putting a fresh mantle authority onto you. And again, you just receive that. Some authority not to be bossy, but to be more uh, conscious, in a sense, of his leading. And those of you who teach will notice it when you start to teach. Those of you who are called to be evangelists will notice it in the interest that other people show when you speak to them, to encourage them. I'd love to pray particularly for those of you called to intercession. Just raise a hand if you think that's you, because I think there are one or two of you here who feel that's particularly your ministry here in intercession. Thank you. Just keep your hands up. I'd like to pray for you because you're going to be the key. You are the key. The foundation. The house of faith that God is building is built on intercession. And you may be the, the unsung heroes, but it, the building won't rise unless it's deeply rooted in intercession. Father, thank you for these men and women that you have given and raised up to pray into existence the things that are in your mind at the moment only. Fill them up, Lord, with your power and love. Break their hearts, Lord, if necessary. Give them Lord, your understanding, your feelings, your thoughts, and your hurt about the millions on the way to destruction. Bless them, Lord. Watch over them. Just raise a hand if you know that you're called to this ministry of evangelization. That's what you feel in your bones. You, You'll often feel it with your feet sometimes. Your feet start to move. And, you and, just, and I want you to dare to receive that again because the Lord is touching you. Father, thank you again that you've never left yourself without those who will speak for you. Now we pray, Lord, for a fresh anointing upon all of us, them, Lord, in particular, for boldness. Fill your church, Lord, with a new boldness and a new power, a new love for those outside, and a new love for you. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 It reminds me of things what someone I really meant to say was, I think if I was starting again, I would take trouble to identify those in your communities that are in natural supernatural interceders or whatever age and I would affirm them pray for them, recognize them and let, let them feel how important they are in the work of the church because um, sometimes they feel isolated and the enemy gets to them and does his propaganda and says they're useless but they're not actually <laughs> absolutely key God bless you, thank you very much Thanks, Bishop Sandy Miller. That was fantastic.